Hello and welcome back to the On The Slab Horror Show, the show that we bring to you each and every Friday night. As the t-shirt says, why Friday night? Because Friday, Friday night, night is, is horror night. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, again, I'm still the only one to don one. Um, we will see the debut of Carl's one hopefully next week. Hopefully. And, and we met each other for the first time the other day. Ever. <laughs> which was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> We've been doing this for it. over a year and we called out. <laughs> We were like two little oh. ones with cups of tea. <laughs> I had a coffee. I don't drink tea. Well, okay, I'm a beverage, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but tonight is not about me and Carl's meeting. Tonight we are joined by a guest coming all the way from Texas. We will go stateside again, um, and we are going to introduce Miss Gina Linnell Schaefer, author, paranormal investigator, and just about everything else. How are you? I am doing great, and I'm thrilled to be with you on this night of horror. Woo! Thanks for having. Thanks for coming onto the show. It's, it's, oh, absolutely. As I said, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to come on. Um, and as as it says, it is a horror show, but we talk about all things that are in insta and related to horror. We've had authors on, which again is yourself. You're an author as well. We've had paranormal investigators on. Shout out to the real life Adams family. They call <laughs> time. Yes. Yeah. Um, and obviously movies. Uh, actors, actresses, directors, special effects. So we go. We we don't discriminate. All spectrum. Doesn't have to be movies. <laughs> it's a good pun there, Carl. Good pun. I know. Yeah. Um, Gina, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for coming on. And I mean, you, you have a you have a really interesting uh, background there. Would you like to uh, tell us about it briefly, or? Well. Um... Several years ago, I mean, I've always been able to, be, always known the paranormal is there. I've been able to see them, mm -hmm. you know, not just sense them, actually physically see them. It really creeps people out when you tell them about family members visiting. They don't believe you, so you tell them what they're wearing, and they're like, oh my gosh, what things they tell you. Um, but as about, I guess it was in my early 30s, I had another near-death experience, and that made everything go haywire went to a different, you know, went to the fifth realm, saw what was going on. And then when I came back and recovered, the ghost never went away. It was like, oh. I was all of a sudden being bombarded. Um, and I had already really just, you know, kind of started my writing career. And of course, I always worried about paranormal horror anyways, because it was a fascination of mine. Mm -hmm. And I always had paranormal dreams. So you might as well write about them, right? Yeah. And, uh, Absolutely. Yes. And so I've done various types of jobs. I've been a social worker. I'm now a teacher. Um, and, but I'm, you know, when people reach out to me, um, whether it's, they feel like that, you know, they have a loved one connecting to them, that happens sometimes, but usually it's because there's a disturbance in their home or they feel okay. like that somebody is attached to them. Um, a lot of times they may think it's somebody that's evil attached to them. It's not always necessarily the case. Um, but it, you know, it does happen. Of course, in my latest book, there is something even attached to him because it's based off a real life serial killer that lived in the area that I'm at. And he is, you can definitely feel his vibe when you go visit his gravesite. Right. That's already, that's intense for me. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's dark in many yeah. ways, more than one. <laughs> he got her in one. Good girl. Um, I have to say, yeah, like, I mean, if, if, I don't know what I would do if I, I felt something in my house or, you know, I, I, I may have, I don't know. But I mean, what would people generally feel for the first time if they think there's something, a presence there? Like, give us an idea. A gut, a gut feeling. And it also depends on the, the impression. So, for example, there have been places that I've walked into places and I feel like this heaviness, very oppressed, or this I can feel their feelings, very sadness. Right. Now, there was one time, and interesting enough, it was in a, a cemetery, and I was with my son, who kind of shared the same gifts, and we felt this feeling of euphoria, like we were just at a party, and uh, we couldn't help but laugh. We took some beautiful pictures that day. I wish I could still recover them. Um, and even at one point, when we were kind of running around and something, uh, my son, he almost fell, and he felt, he said he felt like hands, like, pulling him back, so he, he wouldn't fall. But interesting enough is we were picking up on the feelings that they had 
unfortunately it's not always that enlightened sometimes mm-hmm. though you do feel you know that creepiness and you have a gut instinct i think everybody has a sixth sense they just it's just whether you decide to tap into it or not you yeah. probably have felt something i can't believe that any human being has ever, ever, never walked into a place that didn't mm. have spirits there because they're literally all over the place sometimes yeah. they're trying to interact with us sometimes they're observing most yeah. of the time they don't feel any harm unlike in my you know they don't mean harm unlike my books my books tend to get very graphic because well i like horror <laughs> and, you know i mean there you go <laughs> but um for the most part um it, you know it just depends upon their story and i try to connect to them now um i did have a situation when i was at the marshall house in in um, georgia in okay. room 209 they do have a very aggressive ghost that tries to hold you down right. tried to hold my husband down you know picks on the sun that you know sometimes you do have to tell them off you have to tell them to leave you alone mm. and that's when they get physical with you i have had situations where i've left with bruises and scratch marks that's not very often when i do you know i take pictures of it yeah. i remember one time i was in an old haunted uh it was like an old courthouse but some lawyers had rented it out um and i i felt a pain in my ear and when i took pictures of behind my ear there was there was like echo like green spiritual like the spectral echoplasm that was there yeah. that couldn't be visually seen so mm. obviously somebody angry, but it was a criminal courthouse. You know, yeah, so really, like angry people it, there. <laughs> and that's what I think people need to understand is when you're dealing with spirits, these are, you know, yeah, there's evil entities, evil demons, and that could be a whole separate show. But when you're talking about ghosts, you're talking about human beings that once lived that may not want to disconnect with this world. They won't still want to be a part of it if they were hateful in real life, you know, while they were alive, they're going to be hateful when they're dead. Yeah. If they feel like you're invading their space, they're going to be angry with you. I mean, think about it. Somebody just moves into your house and starts messing with your stuff or changing it around. How would you feel? Mm-hmm. I, 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 I think I think Beetlejuice when you when you talk about that kind of stuff, you know, when the, you know, the when the people come in and they start living in the house. But what I do want to ask you, Jaina, is um, like if let's just say um, my like my mother's passed away, okay, so she's gone a good few years. Let's just say she wanted to communicate with me in this room. Like I'm not saying she is. I I I I don't believe in. Uh, like religion say but I do believe that there's something there so I do believe she's looking over me type thing like I mean so if it's a good ghost or you know like a, 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 a you know do they genuinely try and contact you or connect with you if you get me they have sometimes you'll dream about them okay. or sometimes they will leave a message um just letting you know that they're care- that they care they're yeah. made to- the blinds might rattle a little bit when the window is closed. There's not intent. If you're not feeling fear, they intend no fear. I um, worked with a lady in a, uh, or actually was an agent in a situation. His his wife and his two children were killed in a plane crash. And he all of a sudden had an urge to clean the house like five years after the death. And I think he was feeling guilty because he got engaged to another person. And um, he still, of course, you know, he missed his children. And during this time, it was somebody who never liked to clean. He didn't, he would, you know, let's hire Molly Maid. And then he picked up the couch cushions and he had seen pictures that his children had drawn for him when, right before they died and they were hiding in there. Oh no. And so something put that instinct in him to look there. Mm. Um, and so there will be times. I know myself, I had a very close friend of mine um, that had passed away of cancer, didn't tell anybody he had it. So it was a surprise when he was gone. And about six or seven months later, I am looking for some, you know, I'm looking for something. I'm looking for some lessons. I'm trying to teach you how to put together a history lesson lesson slash with my English lesson 
-hmm. And I opened my closet door. Now, some old lesson plans that he gave me was in a binder, and it literally flew off. Didn't wow. hit me, meant me no harm, but there they were. Kim saying, you know, hey, how's it going? And he's yeah. found a couple of ways to communicate with me. Now, okay. what I have found is, of course, they play with the electricity, mm. but what I have found impressive is I found a couple of spirits that have figured out how to use Siri or how no to way. use, how to use the vocal. Same friend, I was laying in bed one night and my Siri goes off and says, the dogs are out. And I looked, there was nobody out, you know, and I didn't even kind of, fit. it wasn't until that happened, I realized that he was there. I walked off, walked up, walked outside, sure enough, the dogs had gotten out. Wow. And that was just, you know, he was visiting, he happened to see it. And so you'll notice certain smells, yeah. just like maybe a lighthearted feeling. Um, when you're thinking of your mother, she can hear you. you, you can talk to her in your mind. She can hear your thoughts. Yeah. She may find a way to communicate with you. Do you ever feel like you hear her voice in your head? I, I can still hear her voice clear as day. You she's know, and she's she's dead like twenty odd years. She died when she was forty, so um yeah, so like I still hear her voice clear as day. You yeah. know. And I would com converse with her in my mind, like, you know. You know, so maybe maybe that's something I don't know and so I, I, it's a case of I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I just believe everything. You know what I mean? I, I don't want you to think. Sure. I'm, I, I'm genuinely actually interested in because this is the first time I've spoke to someone who's a ghost hunter. If you get me, so oh. yeah. So I'm. I didn't think I was going to be as intrigued as I am. I'm intrigued now. You know what I mean? So, um, uh, well, so what happens? Does does some do people just contact you and you go to their house or? I have. You know, I have, I also have a friend that's a psychic that she gets a lot of calls. I have when um, I was, after I had the near life death experience where I just, I was seeing spirits left and right. They just wouldn't let me, leave me alone. Um, and I thought that people would just think that I was crazy. And so I had, she, this friend that I had, she said, you gotta go see this guy. He, he does ghost hunting and he's in his seventies now. He's very much retired and stuff. And he showed me how to process the EVPs and stuff so that when I would say somebody said something and then it would come across in the EVP, not only did it give me affirmation for myself that I wasn't losing my mind, yeah. but it also would, it, it also um, would, you know, confirm my story to other people. Now yeah. I was, I, I also like to visit other places because again, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated with their stories. I'm a writer. And there was one time when a spirit said, well, why don't you just take my picture? So that's why you see so many ghost pictures on on my Instagram, because yeah. I have literally at times posing. I remember, because um, I like weird places too. And the yeah. funeral museum in Houston is full of ghosts. And it's wow. not the actual building, it's things that they're attached to. So like, if you go, to like the funeral coaches and the cars and stuff. That's where they all are. They're not attached to the coffins that are there yeah. because nobody ever rested in there. And there, it was interesting because we were looking at this one um, uh, hearse that was like an old stagecoach hearse. And my husband was fascinated with it because it was actually something that was featured on Storage Wars and we were looking at it. All right. <laughs> and he noticed that I was being distracted and he was like, what's the deal? So, and I'm like right here. So I snap a picture of the boy and then I show it, see, he's right here. And he was like, that's good to know. And he just casually <laughs> walks away. But he's oh, a good sport about it. And he's experienced things with me and we mm. experienced things in, even in this house. And so fortunately, um, you know, you wouldn't even think that he'd read my books, but he loves to read my books. Um, <laughs> it, he wonders what's wrong with my head sometimes. Um, but yeah, he, it's, you know, some people, they go through these wonderful vacation magazines, mm. you know, looking for places to go on vacation. I'm wa watching old haunted history, you know, <laughs> terrifying places. That's how I determine my vacation spot. That's the way to do it. Yeah, um, right Gina. Way. Always uh, working. Always working, exactly. Gina. What age did you feel that you could you could you know uh, feel something, feel a presence or a, 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 the gift as you say that you have? 
Well, my mom said when I was a baby, the house that they lived in, they rented from an old man um, that was just really grumpy and stuff and smoked a cigar. <laughs> and I know when I, right, he died shortly before I was born. And my mom remembered hearing me laughing in my crib and she smelt a strong smell of cigar smoke. And she didn't tell me that story until after I started recording things. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was a little girl, it was Christmas Eve and I actually even tell the story, but make it one of my characters story in my book, Tenny Hall. But I go into, um, or actually for like the wee hours of Christmas morning, I go into the living room and um, I see my first like full figure ghost, a woman asking for help. Oh, it just so happened that that particular um, Christmas, my parents had gotten me this like bride doll that was probably about three feet high in the white gown. Huh. And it was in front of the, the living room window. So, I mean, if a car passed by, it could easily look like maybe that was the ghost, but I was mm. like, no. This is a woman that was this high and I'm stretching my arms and it's like she's wearing a green plaid shirt and she has strawberry blondish hair, but it was all red on one side. And um, years after that, we found out that on that particular night, a relative of mine, um, actually a relative, she was um, married to my grandfather's brother. And this was in 1973, I think it was, married to my grandfather's brother and um she had disappeared along with two of her friends it's still the longest unsolved mystery oh yeah okay um, missing person case in the state of texas it's been over god 40 50 years now mm. um obviously she's presumed dead but i remembered it very vividly that was my first i think full figure apprehension after you know that i uh, apparition that i'd seen but what was confusing was I saw her solid. She wasn't transparent to me. She wasn't, um, you know, like you would imagine. There are times that I see like figures and outlines and I just know somebody's there. Yeah. And I also know that even though she had a frightening appearance, she was not trying to scare me. Right. You know? that's, that's why you turn around and walk straight back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, Did you go back to bed? Like, no, I I went and I tried to tell my parents that there was, you know, a ghost in the house and that she needed help and all of this. And it just kind of, it got really thrown under the white water. It wasn't until I was seven and my grandfather came to visit me pretty regularly. And what he did was he started telling me things about my mother that nobody else would have known. Okay. And that's when they were like, okay, something's up. Something's really up here. Um, and then my grandmother who died when I was two, but I'd only seen her once when I was like six months old, she would come to visit me and she would tell me little secrets that not harmful secrets, but just weird things that, you know, she would, re you know, my mother would remember. And so, you know, and it was really probably just to verify me because they yeah. realized, because they would get angry with me. They would like, oh, she's making this up. She's trying to get attention. Or, you know, I also had some strange family members that thought, you know, well, if you're seeing ghosts are possessed by the devil, stuff like that. Yeah. And Usually. so, you know, just how people can be. And so mm -hmm. it'd be like, for a long time, I'd just keep my mouth shut. I'd be like someplace with my family and I'd be like, you know, now I can, at least I have a husband who I can tell, hey, look, there's something here. Yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of interest for it, for this kind of stuff as well so which is great so you have uh people that you can actually discuss this kind of stuff with it's yes. fantastic like greg i cut across you there sorry so see the way you were saying you were a baby and you were in the cot right we yes. had a we had a very similar experience in our old house with our oldest fella he was only a baby well not a baby he was i think he might have been a couple of months old and you know the what are they, the walkie talk the radios the baby oh, the baby the baby monitors, the monitors yeah. yeah so so we were in the sitting room probably 25 feet away from his room we lived in a bungalow at the time and over the monitor you could hear him babbling and you could hear a lady talking in the background now we put it down originally to picking up another signal Right, but it kept going and it was as if they were having a conversation. And uh, she says, right, we'll go and check. We got to the door. 
and then all of a sudden there was a noise and then he started screaming as if whatever we got close to left oh and he freaked well family members come to visit and i mean i know that might have been frightening for you at the time um but i can tell you that you could have ancestors you could have a great grandmother or grandmother that comes to visit my son happened to be born on my grandfather's birthday and i was very close to my grandfather up until he died he died of leukemia when i was seven years old and i was devastated when he died and um he would he did come to visit me and that's when you know you know and i think my uncle was the one that really truly kind of believed at first that i really had a gift and um people on my dad's side of the family they tend to have gifts um as well and I know when my son was born, who happened to be born on his birthday, um, he came to visit a lot. And even when I couldn't physically see him, I could smell his cigar smoke. Um, he did get to the point, because sometimes it would make my husband uneasy, and I think to help ease my husband, he just would play pranks on him. Like my husband would come in to check on my son Joseph, and then the room would just like fill with like smoke, or he would spin a picture um just things like that but it, it, practical jokes because he was a jokester and to yeah. finally my husband started to feel really comfortable with it and i explained like look this is just how he is and yeah. then when i started doing evps with my friend richard he popped up on so many i would be on an investigation and then he would just pop up just to say hi and <laughs> when my husband heard that this was his regular voice you know, and giving you parenting advice and things like that, then he realized, okay, this is a good guy. This is a really good guy. So we, if we had, a, we actually had someone come out to the house because there was kind of other little bits that had happened. And uh, he said there was nothing bad there. There was energy there. So we, we, we had him, he came out, he was under the terminology of a demonologist at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and he came out and he cleansed, he done whatever he done, he cleansed the house or whatever. So there was some good energy, there was energy there, that was it. Good, good, I'm glad to hear that. Mm. So that's, that's about the most we got. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me for coughing there. Uh, give us, an, I mean, have you had really, really scary um, experiences with specific type of spirits or? You know, give us a couple of uh, just a short, quick examples. Like, I went on an investigation once, and it was actually to this house. It was like a modular home, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely just filled with spirits. And I don't know if it was part of the land or what. And some of them were friendly, but some of them were so negative. And I know in some areas they were like pushing me, and. Um, you know, trying to, and, and, and I think what had happened, there was this one area that was in between her kitchen and her living room that acted as a portal. Okay. And in her bathroom, there was, and I was actually with my friend um, Pam, who's a psychic at the time, there was something more demonic there. And it, it looked big, huge, almost like a bear, but it had pointed, off, pointed horns. And it was really scary hearing um the ladies that lived at the house there were children at the house um that and the children weren't so much I, I the good spirits were there actually to protect the children and that's what right. they told me but i just started making fun of it um and so we had to do a prayer circle around it and i was um we had a camera person because we were filming it and so we were doing the prayer circle and this thing latched onto my arm like this because it was trying to break the circle and you don't want to break the circle and i could see the claw marks going into my hand oh, wow. or actually into this part of my arm and it was clutching so hard and i mean i remember i was uh this other girl that was with me she was fairly young she hadn't been on many investigations and trying to pick on her apart and what it was trying to do was stretch us apart to break that circle and I was very scared. Of course, I said to leave, leave me alone. Um, but we made it very clear that I did not want to leave that home. What I had found out was there was a teenage girl in the house that had been playing with the Ouija board and had conjured up 
you know, what some girls, teenagers, I did it even as a teenager, yeah. what conjured up some evil things um, without, you know, meaning to just, you know, what they think is child's play. Mm. And of course, we had to have a real serious conversation with her. The family ended up moving. They never really could truly take ownership of that, of that home. And um, see the way you were saying that there was good ghosts there as well, or good spirits, yes. sorry. Would they, again, this seems like I'm mocking, but I'm not. Like, would they combat the, the, the evil spirit to, to, to protect the family? I, what I, re, what I observe, and I can only tell you what I observe from my yeah. experience. That doesn't mean I'm an expert in what I've observed. I'm not an expert in, you know, in everything. Yeah. But what I felt like they were, it wasn't so much they were combating, but they were trying to shield the children. Okay. And keep them safe. And so when I described the one spirit that I saw, the, the little girl with that was on the couch, she was mm. um, an elderly woman. Made, well, I say elderly. I shouldn't say that. I'm, you know, heck, I'm in my 50s. But this was a lady that was like in her mid 60s, kind of a roundish face with a real dimpled chin, um, short gray hair. And, you know, I described it and the, the, the woman said, well, that's my mother. And and so and so she even she tried to rouse. She didn't. She says, I have a picture of her somewhere. She couldn't find a picture of her mother. I think she was just too nervous. And I think that that was, she was there specifically for her daughter to, she couldn't combat it, but what she could do is she could shield. And right. that's what she was doing there. Um, and so, and I don't even know, hopefully when they moved, the mother moved on. I think she maybe was going in between realms because she really was trying to watch that child. Yeah. Um, but I did see there. I did see another spirit that was in another room, and he was a little bit cranky. But he did tell me he said, "You're getting sick," and I suffer from a problem with my pancreas. And um, within a week, I had an acute account of pancreatitis, and I knew immediately what was wrong. And it was like my third, account, you know, my third attack. I, and of course, it just my pancreas just doesn't work. You know, that's another story. But he warned me. He was trying to tell me you know, you need to go to the doctor, you need to get some help. And so, which was why I didn't go on the follow-up investigation because I, I was in the hospital at the time. Yeah. And would you hear like actual, like different voices as in, so that guy was telling you, so you'd hear an actual voice? Yes, would it, in my would head. It, right, yeah, yeah. Like you wouldn't hear like say, someone saying something, but you'd hear quite clear in your head what, what they're saying. Like what's, that's um, cool. Yeah, every once in a while, though, I'll hear something that other people will hear, too. Right. When I went um, to the, uh, I was staying at the Myrtles Plantation in Louisiana. It's one of the most haunted bed and breakfast. And I, I've got, I've, in fact, I've posted so many pictures of ghosts there. Mm -hmm. um, I, had, I don't have a picture of this particular ghost. All I know is his name was Clarence. But we were staying in his room that he was, he was a Civil War soldier. And he um somebody was playing loud music in the room next door and he was kept saying no 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 wow. and even my husband heard and he didn't like the music and so i got and i was sick that day and i, I got up and i went i went to the next door and i said hey look can you please stop the guitar music they, they just just stop trust me just stop yeah. so they did stop they were a really nice couple that was in that room um what was funny though is when it was cold that night that we were staying there and when we were sleeping um i was sound asleep and my husband was trying to get some of the covers and he took some of mine and he said the covers got yanked off and, and wrapped around me <laughs> so i was like well you should have been the one to tell me sir you would have gotten some covers <laughs> very good yeah uh, the, um, so with, with you being in texas obviously it's renowned for having haunted places um and obviously going on on ghost experiences and ghost outings and huntings and investigations is the right word i was looking for um would you believe in not even believe in or would you believe in um the likes of the shadow people and things i've seen shadow people in the corner of my eyes um, I haven't ever had like when I try to interact with them, it's full contact. I usually try to ignore the shadow people, um, just because if they need, if they really want to contact me, they will. Um, and I've heard so many bad things and people that, because I was actually, 
you know, Richard trained me on working with these spirits because he realized very quickly that they were all around me and um, it was so easy for me to get EVPs and it was so easy. So he was, he had a high concern of um, negative energies trying to attach themselves to me. Um, in fact, I even had a situation with the last book that I wrote. And so he did advise me, try to stay away from the shadow people. When you have negative energies attack you, you know, you confront them head on, tell them to leave you alone. Um, and so, yeah, I do believe in it. I do, I have seen them out of the corner of my eyes and I have had the negative energies try to attach, but fortunately I am pretty good at keeping them away at bay, but I do worry about my son and them attaching themselves to my son. In fact, my uh, son was fascinated with my last book and I wouldn't take him to the grave site because the, uh, the victim, the, the serial killer, the, uh, Quirrell that I based this character off of, he he happened to like, um, he would torture and rape um, before he killed them. Uh, very tall, slender, blonde, light-eyed boys, which yes. happens to be a perfect description of my son. Oh, oh, and yeah. because when I, the first time I went there and I knew his energy was there and I snapped a picture of him, um, I, re, you know, I was like, I don't want you at the great side. Not until I know that you are you know, strong enough because once he had read my book, he started doing all, he started going through my research, doing research online. Um, Cause it was a horrendous case that happened in the seventies. In fact, the term serial killer was yeah. coined because of this man. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. And you felt him. Oh, wow. I wouldn't want to be experienced yes. on that now. <laughs> um, well, what I was asking, because he, his, his grave is like probably five minutes from my house. And what I was curious about, because I was, of course, I wanted to be very respectful in the book. And I wanted, I was wondering if there's, you know, any of his victims that might want to talk because yeah. um, there were there were so many missing kids in the seventies, um, missing young men. And they were even attributing some of the crimes of missing people that came from California. And they, you know, they, uh, they, dug up over 28 bodies Jeez. and he had two accomplices he had two teenage boys that he promised he wouldn't kill them if he if they would if they would lure in their friends and he paid them 200 dollars per kid that they brought in and so when one of them one of them ended up shooting him in the house in fact the house went for sale and i feel sorry for the people that live in that house let's just say mm. that yeah um but um, he told the he told this lawyer because the Gacy case came about, mm. and he and they were saying that he had like thirty three, and the young man was bragging saying we got more. They just didn't find them all, and so you know when I was doing the research and I realized that, and they're buried in cemeteries that's all around here, and so I was trying to find out, and I did have you know somebody try to contact me and hit saying that his name was Michael. And, but I think he was just somebody, he was just t kind of torturing in the spirit realm. Mm. And that's when I, you know, I realized, okay, he was there, he was watching. And I did, I, I took a picture of a tree um, beside his, um, that was near his grave. And it was interesting, like this, the snapshot that I got that was like kind of like embedded into the tree. There was a picture of him online um, from the newspapers that it almost like a identical like if i hadn't wow. done it myself you would have thought that somebody took that picture and photoshopped it onto wow. that tree it was so distinct and can i ask and answer me if you want to or not can you tell me who that was cause that serial killer was which is dean coral d-e-a-n coral c-o-r-l-l -L. yeah and um if you do some research on him he's a he, he did some pretty horrendous crimes. Um, I did a little, of course I was graphic in the way that he spoke. Um, the character in the book, yeah, I named him Corey Dennison because I didn't want to give him really a lot of accolades because yeah. he was quite proud of his crimes. Um, and the way he, he's actually the original candy man. And he was got yeah. known because when he, in the uh, 60s, his mom owned a candy shop in the 50s and 60s. His mom owned a candy shop in the Heights area. And he uh, worked for his mom. And what he did to lure young kids, or boys in particular, 
was he would give them candy. And then at some point, his mom gets married, moves, the candy shop go, uh, closes down. So he goes to work for Houston Lighting and Power. And he moves into his father's house and his father's out, his father's married to somebody else. And that, and um, so from, he went from his apartment to the Heights to this house and that's where he was eventually murdered by one of the boys, uh, Wayne Henley, who is still alive. There was two, like I said, there was two young men yeah. um, and Wayne Henley is in the Huntsville prison. And he was the one that actually bragged, hey, I did some of the killings too and we killed more. Um, you know, and Henley shot him, but uh, Coral preferred to strangle them after he tortured them. He would mm. hand them to boards and he would do some pretty awful things to them. Nasty piece of work, and uh, you know, and I like I would like I what I didn't want to glorify him there. I just wanted to get no. the name because I I the, the story sounded familiar to me because I I would have an interest in serial killers as in I find him interesting. I don't like I do support too. them. I don't support I them. Do around I do too. When I wrote Thirteenth Hour, my girl she travels through time and she comes into the different lives of different serial killers. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so clearly, yeah, uh, I, I do too. And actually, I came across him because there was um, I live in Laporte in in Deer Park, Texas, in the seventies. There was also another person that was coined the Candyman because it was a father that had poisoned his kid, and so to. Um, look make it make it look like the kid ingested it through um through candy was he it was on halloween and so he put needles and and different types oh. of uh, drugs and stuff into um trick-or-treaters candies in fact halloween was destroyed for years here in the texas area especially in this area like we went trick-or-treating our trick-or-treating when i was a little girl we went to the school carnival um because this man had put so much fear during this time that nobody would go to anybody's houses anymore that one, and, that one i did know of yeah and so i was looking him up but that's when i found dating coral and i just because i live so close in the area i was able to talk to people that yeah i lived in the house behind that um because he actually lived in 2020 lamar street in pasadena but um he and i changed i did change the address but he um there were so many people that knew him and thought he was this friendly guy, even though he did have, there was shady information about him, but it was also the 70s. You yeah. know, he was killed August 8th, 1973, um, 50 year anniversary coming up. And we didn't have the internet back then. No. So people didn't know he was kicked out of the army. You know, people didn't know that he kept getting fired from jobs. Um, so he was able to hide out probably more so than you know say somebody in today's world yeah oh yeah well you and uh, you know you can't do um, you can't do anything now because of cameras everywhere social media mm -hmm. everything so yeah i'd say it's it's a bit tougher to be a serial killer nowadays you know oh <laughs> thankfully <God. laughs> yeah when you when you look at it, it it does make sense that back in the 70s you had so many of them because of the lack of social media mm. the lack of knowledge the lack of you could go from one state to another and they won't have a clue who you are because there's no database yeah Do you know what i mean it's, it's how a lot of people get away with it and that's why you've heard of so many people being killed in different states uh, exactly by, by said people yeah and at the time um this was um of course you got to take in mind texas very conservative even at the time and they i mean even crime um you know, crime writer Truman Capote, who wrote In Cold Blood, actually had come down here when they were undigging these graves because they found grave sites. He had rented a storage shed, shed in Pasadena, um, he uh, or in South Houston. He had land in Sam Rayburn. He had um, land in Port Arthur. He had all these different places where he buried these. The, he had these two boys bury these kids, and they would talk about. They would actually go fishing on this land and then bury. Them bodies where they they even bragged about having the bodies in their in the guy's van going through the mcdonald's drive through to get something to eat before they go bury them and you know who would have known and these boys that he got to do this at the time they were 15 16 years old that's bad. and 
Yeah, and I mean, and supposedly he, uh, one of the kids did tell his mother and she didn't believe him. And yet he still went back because he said he needed the money. That's, right. you, you hear that quite a lot, don't you? The kids doing stuff and then telling their parents and their parents like, nah, that didn't happen. Yeah. And I think parents now, hopefully, you would think that they listen a little bit more, but there's some that are just like, I think the star story just seems so far fetched mm. that, you know, unless you're living it or seeing it, it's hard to believe. You no, know, this was I... Michael Myers. <laughs> mm. Nothing surprises me anymore, um, Gina. Uh, it really doesn't, like, you know. Um, but I want to shift a little bit now to your uh, writing career. Okay. So give us a little introduction on how you start getting into writing um well i've always been wanting to be a writer and um of course i i've always got stories in my head i didn't have paranormal dreams so they're always all over the place but i had one story that i just had rattling in my mind for a long time that was at Tiffany hall which is a real small town in texas mm -hmm. and um of course there's paranormal prestige and the devil's walking through Tiffany hall and I started writing that, and the very first, I'm about to have it republished again with a more mature cover, but my son, who was 14 at the time when it came out, um, was a little bit of an artist in his own right. So he said, come on, can I do the cover? And I thought, well, nothing's gonna come from it. I'm like, sure, you can do it. And then when I got the book out, um, I went to my husband and I said, you know, hey, you, you wanna see, um, see something, you know, see a piece of your son's artwork? And he was like, yeah, sure. And he was kind of teased and kind of mocked the writing career, not in a mean yeah. kind of way, but he's kind of from that time frame where you got to be really special or not just anybody could do it. And so I handed him the book and I said, yeah, that's what he drew. And the words inside, those are mine. Mm. And so when he actually sat down to read it and then he really liked it, which caught him by surprise, um, he's always encouraging me. I mean, especially on the weekends, did you get some writing done? Did you get some writing done? Um, and it's actually gotten him back into reading. But I do I do try to have, I do have one coming out by Texas Book Publishers. I still haven't gotten a date yet, but my book um, called Coma. Um, and that particular book I'm really excited about. I know my, um, my publisher is really excited about. It takes place in, um, in a realm of hell that is, it's called Coma because it's, um, people that are in that in-between state and so it has to be determined if they're going to live um, live or die and what happens is there's a there's like a casino when you come off the out of the doors you go into a casino when you're gambling and you're playing but there's all these different waters and depending upon the victim's sins the walk that they make to make to because there's a to they make to get to the bar depending upon their sin, they might be grappled at, they might be, they might have weights on them, they may have demons lashing at them, just depends upon whatever the sins are they committed. And some of them are very minor, um, some of them very tumultuous, and they tell their story to the bartender and to an observer that's to the side about uh, their lives and things that they did and how they got and then they, the bartender's like the fairy man. It's kind of based off Dante's, um, Dante's Inferno. And wow. when they put their money in the slot machine, it gives them atrium vita or massa, and which is the Latin for live, live, live or die. die or choose. Yeah. And then they don't know whether they're going to heaven or hell until, you know, until it opens up. And so yeah. a few of them, you know, once they go through the story, um, they a few of them do get choice and they decide they either decide to go back or they decide no i'm done i'm ready to take whatever punishment i have to have yeah. and i was really my my publisher was really surprised about it so he's hoping to get pie piper's prince out because it's local and then he's hoping that coma will make it big oh, but no. right now you know i'm in talks about doing a screenplay with titty hall so we'll see what happens with that too because oh. i'm also working on that sequel that's fantastic. So you've loads going on. Yeah. That sounds like, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be a big reader, but that sounds like definitely something that I'd read. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds very intriguing. Yeah. Listen, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in a minute because uh, we're we're aware of time. 
Okay. Yeah, and I, I, we'd love to have you back on maybe when one of the books is out if you want to have a talk sure. about it with us, you know. But before we let you go, I do want to ask you, because um, it is a horror show and, uh, you know, we like talking about films as well. Uh, so in your opinion, what three kind of films, ghost films, resonated with you the most that you've seen? And Depression. they don't have to be in our, they don't have to be in order. So, okay, um, absolute depression. Um, I have had a situation, or actually a couple of situations, where um, a spirit has shown me how, or showed me, or made me feel how they were killed, um, oh which could be absolutely terrifying. Mm. Um, and let's see. So, and then also I've had where I tend to be a clear seen it. So I had been flashed into his time um and there was a situation where i'm just i'm walking i'm not and all of a sudden i feel like i'm being trans trans um transported into a mm. different time where i see an actual mass shooting going on and um it was i'm not going to say what the event was because oh. it was fairly recent and there's many victims that were around here yeah but i it was like and i even talked to my psychic friend about it and she's like well you're you know she goes your gifts are growing and um you had a connection to somebody you know something or somebody was there yeah. and it was absolutely terrifying because i was like i was the ghost i'm walking in i am um it's like i'm standing there nobody sees me and i'm helpless or something i can do mm. that was terrifying and then there was a situation where a ghost spoke through me and i wasn't aware of it me and my husband were staying and a hotel in Canton, Texas. And um, I, I, I kind of shuffled in bed and he was like, what's wrong? I said, there's a ghost in here, but she won't tell me what she wants. And he's like, okay. And he's just kind of used to that. And then all of a sudden I, I stood up and I started talking and my husband said, that was not your voice. And I don't remember it, but I'm giving him information. And he said, it was definitely a female voice but she was talking through you and it was not your voice. It was not you. And the idea, cause I felt like a human Ouija board. So the idea that a spirit was able to do that to me, it did kind of frighten me up. That was, that was pretty terrifying. I would imagine so. Yes. Wow. So, um, yeah, that's, you can't even like, you can't even write films on those things. Like, like really when, once it really happens, so you can't yes but i try i try <laughs> i try to get it out there i'm pretty good with words so yeah i try to get it out there i i think if you're doing it I'm on sure the <laughs> i yeah i think if you're doing it on, on a i am um, on, on a page mm -hmm. you know i always always thought that the uh you know the the, the book was always a bit scarier than anything that you know you yes. see because the mind can conjure up ungodly things you know right. and uh, i think that's yeah i think you'd get i think you get more scares from a from a book i feel anyway if you have any sort of imagination or a bit crazy imagination like you know uh yeah i think fear of the uh, fear of the unknown fear of the unseen is always mm -hmm. much better if you want to scare i think <laughs> and i will tell you as a writer and i always get asked you like, like how do you get your ideas and things like that and I, when I sit in front of my computer and I start writing, I have no clue what's going to come out until it's out. And oftentimes it's very, very graphic. And I had a friend of mine recently ask, okay, what's the scariest thing about being a writer or about being a horror writer? And I had to write knowing that that crap is in my head and I didn't know how to get, you know, and it just comes out. Wow. And then I'm, you know, just, I'm going to say to you, I'm in a, I'm in a metal band. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a, a vocalist in a metal band and that's exactly how I write my lyrics. I write them subconsciously. I don't know what I'm going to write about until it come, hits the page and that's then right. I can put some context to it. So that's actually cool to hear that you're, we have a similar type deal there going on. I think that's very cool actually. Yeah. You know? But um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll finish up now, Gina, if that's good with you. Yeah, it's yeah, been a, it was great meeting you. Absolutely, it was it was it was great to, to hear your story and hear, um you know and I'm, as I said maybe you could, you'd like to come on again and we'll talk more about some uh, ghosts and 
we'll try and get you. We'll 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 get some more ghost stories for you from Ireland. Absolutely, I'd love to share. Because from what I've heard, this place is terrifying. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But for now, uh, we'll we'll uh, say thank you very much for coming on, and it's been a pleasure chatting to you. But for now, Greg is going to take us home. We're going to close out the same way we close out every Friday night, baby. In the words of the great George A. Romero, stay scared. Woo! <laughs> now. <laughs>